Okay, uh, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, my name is Rich Schneider. I am a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm a basic science researcher. My research focus is on the development and evolution of the vertebrate skeleton. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the uh, journey that we've taken at the University of California system uh, towards uh, open access uh, and give you kind of a sense of how it is that I as a researcher and, and my fellow researchers and fellow faculty and others can really help move institutions in the direction that we want uh, to see major transformation in scholarly communication. Uh, in that uh, role of kind of public policy and advocate, um, I have uh, been involved in, in our academic senate uh, and um, most recently serving again as chair of the University Committee on Library and Scholarly Communication. Okay, so we pretty much all have uh, seen in, in one form or another uh, many of the challenges that are facing the current system of scholarly publication, of scholarly communication, scholarly publishing. Um, obviously, it's very expensive. Uh, the publication system is a, is a costly one. Um, access is quite limited uh, for many people. Uh, usage of the content that is transmitted through scholarly communication is quite restricted. And there's a tremendous amount of inertia. Uh, this is inertia within large institutions uh, like the University of California system or in academia in general. Uh, there is inertia within scholarly communities themselves, authors, they like the way that things get done and they don't really want to change. Um, and of course there's inertia within uh, the uh, commercial publishing industry and the other uh, folks who transmit this information. Nobody really likes uh, to see a lot of change, especially if it affects their bottom line. Um, and particularly the commercial publishers and the dominant subscription-based system um, has created a, an unsustainable, closed, and restrictive way of doing business. Uh, it's estimated that uh, between eight and ten billion dollars are spent worldwide in journal subscriptions and at the University of California system we spend well over forty million dollars a year accessing the content. Um, a lot of that content we've generated ourselves. Subscription costs continue to rise, so over the last 10 years, we've seen over a 60% increase in subscriptions, um, and if we just look at the STEM fields, uh, we've seen well over 100% increase in the cost of those subscriptions. Then we also have the monopolistic practices of these large commercial publishers. 50% of all papers are published by five publishers, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, Taylor, and Francis, and Sage, and these folks extract billions of dollars in profits with large profit margins. Um, and again, much of this money is coming from academic institutions, nonprofit institutions with, with public missions. And in many ways, um, this is coming straight out of taxpayers' pockets. Many of the readers of the content that we generate don't have access, and many of the scholars who want to reuse this content, they need to seek permission, so authors have to get permission to reuse their own work because they've transferred copyrights, um, and they have to make payments, and the rights uh, are limited in how that work can be used. So in the framework that I've just articulated, the open access movement was really intended to transform publishing from this kind of closed predominant model to one that is open um, and involves the, the universal um, and free dissemination of scholarly content. Um, and so there have been many strategies that have been undertaken over the last 15 years. One is funder mandates for open access repositories. This is the green open access, so the um, NIH large repository, the University of California. Uh, we have the e-scholarship repository, so funder mandates have, have been one strategy. Um, institutional mandates, so individual institutions have um, decided to put the work of their scholars in their own repositories. Um, and then we've also seen the birth of open access journals, journals that are either sponsored by societies, professional societies, or um, we see some fee-based open access journals, these gold open access journals like PLOS and Biomed Central and others. Uh, we see fee-based open access articles within subscription journals. These are the hybrid articles. Um, and then we've also seen the emergence of institutional open access funds to support scholars publishing in open access journals. Um, as well as institutions deciding how they want to take the money that they have available to support scholarly communication and decide to start putting that money into open access uh, models of, of scholarly communication. 
Um, at UCSF and at the UC uh, system, uh, the open access strategy that we've adopted pretty much follows along these lines. We started with an open access policy and a series of policies. UCSF passed a policy in 2012. The UC system passed an open access policy that applied to all faculty in 2013. And then we passed an open access policy in 2015 that applies to all scholars at UC, so faculty, staff, and uh, students, and so on. Um, and in these policies, authors get to retain copyright in their scholarly work. Um, and that allows the 50,000 or so articles that UC generates every year uh, to become freely and immediately available through our institutional repository, again, e-scholarship. Um, and currently, around the world, there are well over 800 open access mandates and policies worldwide. So the question, though, is really, has this done enough? Has this helped us achieve the goals that we've wanted to achieve? And the answer really is no. Open access strategies have not yet transformed scholarly communication the way we've envisioned. So despite 15 years of global effort, paywall access and subscriptions are more prosperous than ever. It is still the predominant mode of scholarly communication. About only 15% of papers that are published are published primarily as open access. 85% of the content um, is published behind a paywall. And then publishers have figured out a great scheme. They can collect even more revenue by combining subscription and hybrid open access journals, often for the same content. And this is referred to as double dipping. Um, and while the funder and institutional repositories help make content available, there are challenges and burdens with workflow, author participation, licensing, publisher compliance, and article versions. So then the question is, how can we accelerate a large scale transformation to open access? Um, and so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna tell you what we have been uh, undertaking at the University of California system to really help push the ball all the way down to the end of the court and get us to um, an open access transformation. And the idea really is uh, something that is you know, tried and true, which is to think globally but act locally. Um, the first thing that we are, have been doing is been working with individual author communities, um, developing workshops and templates for helping authors work with their professional societies. Uh, many of our authors are editors. There's certainly uh, many of them are peer reviewers. Our faculty serve in, in many capacities in the editorial process um, and providing them with the tools and resources to make their subscription journals open access. And the idea here is to try and flip to open access journal by journal, peeling away uh, journals from commercial publishers and bringing them back to the academy. Um, the second strategy has been to join with international partners and pledge to divest from subscriptions and reinvest in open access publishing. And this is an attempt to flip to open access publisher by publisher. And the third strategy is to align our institutional policies and practices towards open access. Um, and so on the one hand, while we've been yelling very loudly for open access and change in commercial publishing, at the same time, we continue to give millions and millions of dollars to the publishers to sustain a subscription system that we all want to change. And so finally, that's the idea to put our money where our mouth is and push for open access principles in our publisher agreements when we have the leverage, when we have the money that we're about to spend to start to ask for things that we want. Okay, so the first point, providing author communities and professional societies with tools. Um, the first question really that we need to understand is what do researchers want? What do uh, researchers want out of their journals? Um, and really the idea is that when we talk to researchers, we find that they want to publish in their favorite journals. They don't necessarily like the idea of switching to new journals, of creating a whole other parallel universe of literature um, that is open access. They really want the journals that they've known to love through their whole careers, that have long histories. Um, they want those journals to be open access. Um, they want their work to be highly read, widely read and highly cited, so that clearly is in alignment with open access. They want the rights to reuse and share their work. Um, they want to maintain familiar workflows. They don't want to have to adopt a whole new set of processes and practices. They like peer review as it currently uh, stands. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is all correct. It just means that this is really what, what we hear when we talk to our colleagues. Um, they want to access all the content in existing journals, so they don't want to uh, encounter paywalls uh, to, the, to, to the content. Um, and, but at the same time, they also want to make sure that if they are moving away from a system where everybody has free access to content, they're not at the same time creating a system where there are barriers for other people to actually publish their work. 
Um, and so one of the ideas behind journal flipping, that is taking existing journals and making them open access through a variety of means, is that for many people, this maintains the canon, canon of existing journals, and they, they like that. Um, it makes open, open access the default state, which increases the impact and the visibility of their work. Um, it supports the rights of authors, researchers, and readers. Um, it enables existing processes and workflows to remain intact. Um, and it promotes the global transition away from journal subscriptions. And finally, the savings that come out of reallocation of subscription monies can be turned into new modes of open access publishing. And of course, this is something that we're all very excited about. Um, the second effort that we've been undertaking at an institutional level is to join with international partners and pledge to divest from subscriptions and invest in open access publishing. Um, and there are, there are many different ways that we can do this, um, and I'm just going to give you one example, um, and that is the uh, Open Access 2020 um, uh, initiative, uh, which was started by the Max Planck Institute. Um, and this is a global initiative to accelerate the transition to open access. Um, and uh, there, are, there are people who are strong advocates and there are people who are strongly against this. Um, and there are many reasons, uh, I, we think, as an institution, why we want to align ourselves with that. Um, and primarily, what it, we see this as an opportunity um, to piggyback on a global initiative that says very clearly to the commercial publishers that we are serious about, about transformation. Um, and that we aim to transform a majority of today's scholarly journals from subscriptions to open access publishing in accordance with community-specific publication preferences while continuing to support new and improved forms of open access publishing. And that we are sending a clear message that we will pursue this transformation by converting the resources that we currently spend on journal subscriptions into funds to support open access business models. We see this very much as a transition from a current subscription model to a model that is uh, open access and uh, takes on many different forms that support the individual needs of different author communities. Um, currently, more than 150 countries and organizations and institutions have signed on to the OE 2020 Expression of Interest. And within the UC system, six of our campuses have signed on. Um, there are other institutions within the US have signed on. And we also anticipate that uh, the remainder of our campuses um, will, at some point, sign on. And then finally, uh, I want to discuss how we have begun to align our institutional policies and practices uh, towards open access. Um, and that is to push for our open access pr uh, principles and publisher agreements. Again, at the moment when we are signing these very large commercial licenses, these big deals, we have the greatest amount of leverage. Um, we are giving them our money, and we all know if we accept money from funders, that funders provide all kinds of stipulations on how we can spend our money, what's an allowable expense when we have a grant, and so on and so forth. And so we feel that because we are using taxpayer money, every cent that we spend on subscriptions comes from the taxpayers of California, that because we are using that money that we can exert pressure on how we want that money to be spent. And with that in mind, um, the committee, UCLASC, which is the University Committee on Library and Scholar Communication, uh, issued a Declaration of Rights and Principles uh, for Transforming Scholarly Communication. And the idea here is to align our institutional policies and practices towards the goal of replacing subscription-based publishing with open access. And so we have proposed that the University of California assert these rights and principles with, when negotiating with publishers during license renewals. Now, many of these publishers, uh, many of these principles are obvious to many of you in the room, um, and many of them are things that are already happening. Some of them are aspirational. Um, but what we hope is that we were able to convey what we want the future state of scholarly communication to look like. Um, and so I will go through these quickly. I've put links to all these documents at the end of my talk. But the first one is that we do not want any more copyright transfers. We do not want to transfer the rights of our work to the commercial publishers. We want to retain control of our own work. Um, the second is that we don't want any restrictions on the preprints of our work when we submit them for um, into repositories or into uh, preprint servers. We don't want that to affect our ability to publish that work. Um, we don't want to have any waivers on our open access policies. Uh, met many publisher, publishers still ask us to waive our open access policies before they will publish our work, and so we no longer want that. Um, 
we don't want any delays to sharing, so no embargoes of our work. A lot of these repositories require a six or 12 month embargo. Um, we no longer want delays to sharing our work. Um, we want no more limitations on author reuse. We want to be able to uh, use our own work in derivatives. We want to be able to share that work widely. Um, we don't want any impediments to rights reversion. In many cases, we've transferred our copyrights for past articles. We want a, a, a simple, straightforward way of reverting our rights, getting our rights back to that work. Um, and along the same lines, we don't want to see any more curtailment of copyright exceptions. Uh, we want to be able to use our work and share our work widely. Uh, we don't want to have any barriers to data availability. Uh, we want to be able to share our data and keep our data freely available uh, for all the reasons that we've just heard uh, in a previous talk. Um, we want no more constraints on content mining. A lot of the commercial publishers are packaging the data in ways um, that make it very difficult for people to get access to that content. So we want that data to be um, parsed and machine readable and easily accessible to many different people. Um, we don't want to see metadata closed and hidden behind um, paywalls either. We want to be able to have access to that metadata. Um, we don't want any more free labor. We estimate that the University of California faculty contribute over $20 million a year based on FTE, time and effort, to sustaining commercial journals. So whether, whether that's a form of editorial work or peer review, we want to see that, that, um, that effort come back to us to help support the scholarly communication ecosystem. Um, we're no longer willing to pay for subscriptions long term. Um, we see this as a system that is um, the, the past and the future uh, we see uh, does not involve subscriptions. Um, we don't want to see any more permanent paywalls. We want to see commercial publishers giving us a plan, timeline, for when they uh, intend to transition their journals to open access. Um, no more double payments, so our hybrid journals we want we want to see any contributions that we make, any open access payments that we make to offset the costs of our subscriptions as we transition to a subscription system. We also um, don't want to see any hidden profits. The pricing, the article processing charges, and other charges that are made by commercial publishers are completely opaque. And so we want to see transparency in the cost. We want to see the cost reflect the true um, uh, uh, cost of the services that are being provided. We all know that the, the current levels of article processing charges are, have been set very arbitrarily by the commercial publishers. Um, and uh, we don't want to see any more uh, large deals with publishers without offsetting the cost of our open access payments. Um, we don't want to see any new, more, any new paywalls for our, our work, and, and we want all of our work to be open access um, in, in, um, on a, a publisher's website. Um, and finally, uh, we don't want to see any more non-disclosure agreements. The publishers have hidden behind non-disclosure agreements for a long time. We want all of these deals to be out in the open with the pricing out in the open um, so that everyone else can benefit from, from these efforts. So this is really our integrated strategy for transitioning to open access. It's to collaborate and leverage alliances. Um, and it's being realized in the UC system through uh, a variety of stakeholders and governing bodies, um, including the Council of University Librarians, uh, the Faculty-Led Committee on Library and Scholarly Communication, and the Provost System-Wide Library and Scholarly Information Advisory Committee, otherwise known by the horrible acronym SLAZIAC. Um, the other strategy is to advocate for transformation. That's why I'm here talking with all of you. Our strategy reflects the call to action that Slaziak uh, wrote in partnership with the Council of University Librarians and the University Committee on Library and Scholarly Communication, and it champions upending the status quo through journal licensing negotiations. Uh, we intend to aim high and stand on our principles, the principles that I just articulated to you, um, and we intend to put our plans into action. We are currently undertaking negotiations with commercial publishers, and we are initiating pilots um, to implement uh, these plans that we've been making for the past uh, 10 years or so. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of many different people who have participated in this um, for, for many years, uh, many people who are, are, I cannot fit onto this slide, but uh, members of the of this academic senate, faculty members of the um, UCLASC, uh, the Council of University Librarians, the, the members of Slaziac, the members of the California Digital Library, um, the, the folks who wrote the Pathways to Open Access document by the California, uh, by the Council of University Librarians, 
Um, there's also a multi-institutional working group for transition to large-scale open access that I participate in with many other institutions in Canada and the U.S. Um, and then finally, um, the folks at the Open Access 2020 um, initiative. And so here are some links to some of these documents. And thank you for your time and happy to take any questions. Okay. Yeah, kind of was expecting that. Who got their hands up first? <laughs> okay. Have you had any success with flipping biomedical journals from subscription to open access? Because societies rely on that revenue, and as much as I would love to see that happen, they've been very resistant to that switch. Yeah, that's a great question. So at UCSF, where I am, we are a biomedical campus. And so we've been working closely with many different academic editors to see uh, what the appetite is to switch some of their journals. So the California Digital Library has an e-scholarship platform, and they do have some biomedical journals on there that they have successfully either started or moved from a um, commercial platform. Um, you know, I think that for many biomedical journals, it will be a challenge, but there are also, um, there's also lots of low-hanging fruit. Uh, we had a meeting uh, with one colleague who his professional society gets about $100,000 a year uh, from their commercial publisher as, as revenue from their journal, um, and it's not an open access journal. And so through conversations, we realized very quickly that if that's all they need from their commercial journal to sustain their society, and they own the title to their journal, which is another big um, impediment to flipping these journals, is who owns the, the copyright to the journal. In this case, they could have a very low article processing charge, somewhere in the order of you know, 250 to $300 to get that kind of revenue. And so if they were to migrate their journal to a very low cost publishing platform, um, then they could easily switch their journal to open access. So there seems to be a lot of um, excitement around this, particularly in some of the small society-owned journals. Yeah. Oh, wait there first, sorry. Okay. Uh, you're next. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. This summer, the UC system put out a call to action and asked for partners, libraries, other systems, uh, consortia, and others. But I don't recall there being a mechanism to convey that intention to partner. So how would we go about doing that? Um, great question. So we actually, there's a, a workshop uh, that is happening on Wednesday and Thursday of next week um, in, at UC Berkeley. Um, and it's a, a large workshop with people from all over the place who are participating in, in this call to action to basically translate this, these different pathways and talk about how you would actually translate these pathways into actionable um, items. Um, and so, but if you go on the website link uh, for the um, cool Pathways to OA, there's a lot of information about uh, both the Pathways to OA document, but also how you can participate and, um, and you know, bring some of these ideas back to your institution. Um, hello, uh, I'm from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur from India. So we, it's the largest uh, technical school in India. Uh, in India, there are more than 700 universities uh, which are funded centrally by the government. So uh, recently, the ministry uh, actually coordinated an effort to centrally negotiate with all publishers uh, through a committee and also uh, set up the committee to explore how open access movements uh, can be joined on. There are two central questions that uh, still remain very difficult. One is uh, the publishers, particularly the major five and few others uh, mentioned, they are kind of brands which are very strong. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the faculty who have to send their publications, uh, their promotions, their all evaluations, uh, formal evaluations uh, in the academic career paths are strongly related to which publishers or which journals they are published with. So they are very reluctant from that point of view. The second question which has been raised frequently is there's been a large proliferation of open access journals, particularly the technology area, which have very low quality there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole process happens in one, one week and they still have a high impact factor values. So how do you uh, I mean, refrain from people on the propensity of publishing in the journal. So, which is these two factors that strongly, uh, you know, impeding the movement to open access uh, journal? The issues that you have talked of, at least in the Indian universities. So, I would like your comments and advice on that. 
Sure, great, thanks for those questions. Let me take the second one first, which is the large influx of predatory journals, which as a basic science researcher, I probably have easily 15 to 25 a week coming into my journal, for, into my inbox from all kinds of journals uh, that you know, you've never heard of, that the names are slight variations on existing journals and so on and so forth. Um, one of the uh, advantages of flipping the existing canon is the name recognition. Um, and so those journals really um, would allow you know, a flip to open access without having to roll the dice and publish in a journal that no one's ever really heard of or really is there to, to prey on the goodwill of faculty or researchers who want to publish open access but don't really know how to distinguish a good open access journal from the other. Um, in terms of brand recognition, I would say that most researchers know the name of their journal, but they don't necessarily know who their publisher is, unless maybe it's a nature-branded journal, for example. Um, but publishers turn out to be less important to researchers than the actual journal name. And so another advantage of flipping existing journals is the, the, the prestige of a journal, um, if that is not a publisher-owned journal, can move away from the publisher and still uh, retain its impact factor, which is, you know, as, as problematic as that may be, is important to many people. Um, and so I think, uh, again, that's another advantage of trying to uh, flip existing journals. Your first question about uh, countries that have centrally funded research enterprises, I would highly recommend that you take a look at Plan S, which is um, a plan that's um, gaining a lot of momentum, particularly in Europe, uh, where um, a lot of the funders are signing on to an initiative that they intend to force publishers to make all of the scholarship that is generated from, um, from research grants open access. Um, the plan sets a cap on how much the costs should be to publish that work. Uh, and so in, in the United States, we have a very decentralized funding process. We don't have the ability to kind of manage individual institutions and, and, and um, deal with the sun, uh, funding centrally, although some private funders might be able to take care of that. But certainly in the case, it sounds like in India, where you have large centralized funding bodies, um, you might take a look at Plan S. Hi, over here yeah. on your right. Hi. Um, if I, under, mis if I misunderstood your point, please correct me, but I took away from early in your presentation that individual faculty actions and discipline-based actions like declining to serve on editorial boards or declining to do peer review or deciding to publish in a different place is kind of off the table in, in, in this sphere that you're pushing for kind of a different kind of action. And I wonder if you can just say why that's off the table. I mean, I know it's hard, but isn't that a way to put additional pressure on the system to make some of these other things happen in a way that faculty can contribute themselves to make this change that, it, that you're obviously so passionate about that we are too? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry if I convey that impression in any way. No, that is completely on the table. Um, and so we have, we feel like we have a lot of uh, weapons in our arsenal, so to speak. And um, so the first is the money, but clearly the free labor and the free scholarship that we give them are two of the other biggest components um, that we can, you know, use to exert pressure. Um, and so um, it's... It's, I think it's easier to start with the institutional uh, money, um, particularly because that's in alignment with our public mission. You know, I'm a big advocate of academic freedom. I'm certainly not going to tell a faculty member who serves on an editorial board for a particular journal and by a particular publisher what he or she can do with his or her time. Um, but that being said, anything that we can do to encourage faculty to, uh, if we get to a place where the commercial publishers are not willing to, uh, to negotiate with us, as we've seen in Germany and we've seen this in Sweden, uh, with Elsevier, for example, um, we would certainly encourage our faculty to think twice about peer reviewing for a journal or peer reviewing for, or serving as an editorial board member or serving as an editor for a publisher, absolutely. So no question about that at all. Okay, so, so very, uh, very quickly, a last question, I think. Um, it seems like you've talked about two different goals. One seems to be to increase the, the rights that authors have to their own work, and another one seems to be to reduce the cost um, overall that institutions are transferring. And sometimes it seems that you've talked about one, sometimes you've talked about the other. It, it, they're a little bit contradictory at some point, and so I guess I'm wondering, is there one of them that's a higher priority? 
Well, I don't necessarily see them as contradictory. I think when I talk about costs, we're really talking about the amount of money that we spend to sustain a system that we don't think works to our advantage. Um, and the reason why that system doesn't work to our advantage is because we transfer information that we've generated for free, we transfer it for free, and so we want to retain the rights. We no longer want to transfer that information. We want to keep the rights so we can reuse it the way that we want. But we also want to stop paying uh, to support a, a system that we think is not in our best interest. And so, sure, um, publishing is expensive, and there are probably, I'm sure there are lots of costs with infrastructure and all the things that uh, publishing involves. Um, I think institutions are willing to pay for services as long as those services are in alignment with our mission as a public institution um, and with our goals and our, our principles and our rights. Um, so I, I don't see them as contradictory. I see them as, you know, kind of one is a part of the, of the other, which is basically trying to use the money that we spend to transform the system uh, in a way that, that um, allows you know, scholars to basically reuse and share their work freely.